Hello, I am Dr. Sarah Wanamuller, and along with everyone else, I want to welcome you to the 2021 Education Law Symposium. I'm glad that you have chosen to set aside some time during these days in July to um, learn more about the law and to enjoy this time together with your colleagues from across the United States. I am looking forward to July of 2022 when the Education Law Symposium will once again be in Louisville, Kentucky, and we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Education Law Symposium. I was a student at Spalding University in the doctoral program when Sister Mary Angela first spoke about starting something like the Education Law Symposium. And look where it has developed in the last 20 years and what a gift that has been to um, Catholic education and public education as well. So many of you may have been a part of this law symposium for many years. For some of you, it might be your very first one, but I would probably fairly say with a great sense of certainty that it probably won't be your last because once you come to this, it just becomes something that you look forward to and um, enjoy and want to keep coming back to as well. Well, I um, would like to begin by sharing my screen here and um, the slides that you are going to see um, are certainly going to be made available to you as well as all of the policies that I will be sharing with you also. And we are certainly grateful to Loyola Mary Mountain and CEA for sponsoring and making this happen. This session deals with both parent, student, and faculty handbooks. And I want to start off by telling you that I have my 2021. 2022 handbooks revised. And at the end of the session, I will tell you how to get uh, Word document copies of each of those handbooks. So I have the parent student handbook, the faculty handbook, the volunteer handbook, the athletic handbook, the extended care handbook, and the substitute teacher handbook. As I said, they are Word documents, so um, they are live for you to just copy and paste policies that might be beneficial to you, your school community to put in your handbook. The uh, school that I created is called Holy Cross School. Um, so it's, I am not a principal of a school anymore. I was a teacher and a principal for 37 years before coming to higher education full time over 10 years ago. So um, this is a bogus school that I have created that these policies and these handbooks pertain to. So feel free to request the handbooks um, and to copy and paste any of those policies that you hear about that you think would be beneficial to your school community. Some things that I think are important with all handbooks, regardless of which one we're referring to here, is that your handbooks are revised annually. And I think it is really important that we look at the policies that we have in our handbooks and that we decide whether or not they are still pertinent to our school community so that they are alive and that they are documents that can be respected by um, all of our stakeholders as well. 
The timeline that I always appreciated as a principal and that I really tried to adhere to was to have the handbooks ready in March every year, particularly the parent, student, and the faculty handbooks. I wanted the parents to have the handbook for the next year prior to spring break. I would always say to the parents, well, if you go on spring break and you feel like you're bored and your beach read is exhausted, you can always read the school handbook. Nobody thought that was real funny, but I thought it was an interesting um, suggestion. But at least they know before they sign up for the next school year what they're getting into and what the policies and practices of the school are going to be for the following year. And I think that's really important. I think that's really helpful to the school community. Uh, it's also helpful for teachers before they sign their contracts for the next year to know what's going to be the expectation of them as a faculty member at your school. Um, one year I put a policy in place that said for every minute you are late, this is a faculty member, that accrues toward one of your personal days. And, and I had a teacher who just said, there's no way I can adhere to that. I can't plan to be on time every single day. Well, showing up is really important. Showing up on time is important. So it was wise that that teacher understood that that was an expectation. If she couldn't adhere to that expectation, it was probably wise that she did not return to the school. Keeping your policies current is also really important. Some of you have heard me uh, mention before that I once revised a school handbook not too long ago where one of the policies in the handbook said that girls should not wear jellies. Now, depending on your age, jellies were in fashion back in the 1980s, which means that nobody had looked at that policy for a long period of time, because I think you'd be kind of hard pressed to find jellies today to wear. But if I guess if you leave the policy in there long enough, it might come back again. And, uh, be a pertinent policy, but you don't want to take a chance on that. It's also important to note the changes in the handbook. Now, some people do this by highlighting the change policies um, in yellow or green as a highlight. I like to change the color of the font. Like you will see in my handbooks that they are revised uh, with a color red this year, and then they will be with green next year. So individuals who are well-versed in the handbook don't have to go back and read the entire handbook again. All they have to do is look and see what stands out with those colors as well. And one of the things that I do during the school year is and even now, when a policy, there's a policy I think I need to include in next year's handbook, I'll go ahead with my online document and type in that policy with the new color. So it makes the revision of the handbook really very easy because it's been an ongoing process of revision. I always receive a question about how should the handbook be arranged? And you will see that for the most part, my handbooks are arranged in alphabetical order, but there is no gold standard to how they have to be arranged. Some handbooks that I've reviewed are grouped together by categories um, and that's absolutely fine as well. My handbooks do not have a table of contents to them. And so that's always a question that I receive too. Why not a table of contents? Well, what happens is anytime you add a new policy in, then the table of contents is off. So um, I put my handbooks to the most part in alphabetical order and find it is easier for me to be able to find policies. But you wanna do what is right for your school community. You'll see in the slides that I have one slide that refers to how a handbook was used in a court case to show that it was legally binding. And the judge looked at the uh, 
handbook as being a contract with the parents. So I think when you write and develop your handbooks, you have to realize that they could be uh, submitted in a court of law to see whether or not what you said you were going to do is actually what you did in practice in your school community. And then finally, a handbook exchange. Uh, I think it is really a good idea if you are a school principal that you send your handbook to another school principal and just say, would you look at this handbook and see if it makes sense to you? Do these policies make sense to you? Um, have another set of eyes read them. Because what happens is when we are so used to working with writing a policy and putting this handbook together, we feel like it really makes sense to us. But when you ask someone else with a different set of eyes to look at it, you get a much different opinion. Now, you have to not be thin-skinned in doing that because you have to be able to accept that criticism and make the decision as to how you might change your policy also. I think it's also a good idea that you as the school administrator are not the only one that develops that policy, those policies that go in your handbook. I was an advocate of a committee that was composed of not only uh, teachers, but um, a trusted parent, and then uh, a student in the school, like in a K through eight school, ask an eighth grade student to serve on that committee. Also, obviously a student that, that was trusted or in the senior, a senior in high school. Keep in mind, they have nothing to, uh, to lose by the policies that are gonna be put in place, but they also give you a lot of really good information as to whether or not those policies are really adhered to or the ways in which students have found to get around the policies also. So um, our school, our students can be a great help to us um, in, in handbook development. At the university, um, I'm also a part of writing the handbooks for our clinical practice and for our clinical interns. And um, I will tell you that many times the policies are driven by lawsuits and potential lawsuits that we face based on a teacher candidate's, uh, a disgruntled teacher candidate's uh, viewing of the policies that are in the handbook as well. So it's not just in comprehensive education that we have these handbooks um, in higher education also. And I will say it makes our life so much easier. As a school principal, I frequently referred to what was in the handbook in dealing with issues and situations and say, this is what the handbook says. And that parent signature page is really important. I also had the students sign a signature page, which was a covenant, not a contract saying that they had read the handbook or had had the handbook read to them and they agreed to adhere to the policies during that academic year as well. Now here are some items that I think should be included in all handbooks, uh, whether they are parent, student, faculty, volunteer, athletic, or whatever. And that is that you have a cover for every handbook. And my handbooks are all electronic. Um, I don't make paper copies of the handbooks anymore. I, I used to, um, as a principal, before we became so used to everything being digital, uh, I saved a lot of money whenever we made that conversion, I will say. The parent-student handbook was on the school website. So it also served as a PR tool for individuals looking at our school because it kind of gives a snapshot of what our school is really all about. Now the faculty handbook was on a, um, the, just the T drive, just for the teachers to access. But any other handbook that involved the general school community, like the athletic handbook, the volunteer handbook, um, those would be on the school website. So items to include in all the handbooks would be a cover, 
for the handbook that, and on that cover, it has indeed the name of the school, the, if you have a school logo, the address, the phone number, the website, the fax number. So all those types of vital information are there on the cover as well. And then a welcome. Uh, I'm a fan of a welcome letter written by the principal and assistant principal or the principal and the pastor, or if you're in a school that has a president, it might be the principal and the president who writes this letter of welcome. And I also strongly believe in when a letter is written to the school community, and I, I did this for two decades as a principal, I always began with my letter with a scripture quote or some quote from um, a saint or um, some other inspired teaching because I felt in a sense that was my opportunity for catechesis with the reader. But I think that welcome letter is really important um, before they even start reading the policies. So they have a sense of what our school community is about just from that letter. And then I think the history of the school should be in every handbook. Keep in mind that everybody's going to read every single handbook, perhaps. And your schools have a very rich history if they've been around, some of them for over 100 years. And other schools are very new. Uh, when I became principal of a school in North Carolina, our school was only four years old. So a very new school community. But nonetheless, that history is really important to share as well. The mission statement and the philosophy state, what are we really about? What are we really about here? What do we really believe? And if you haven't carefully looked at your mission statement in a long time, this might be the time to pull it out and look at it again, because I think it is really important to say who we are, what we're about, and what we really stand for. The last two elements, the right to amend and the parent signature page should be in all handbooks. And that right to amend is extremely important so that you can amend the handbook uh, even after it has been written. Because you're not going to think of every single policy. You're not going to think of that. And particularly in the last year and a half when we dealt with COVID, who would have ever thought of policies that would need to be amended into the handbook in a very quick fashion. So now you only amend that handbook when it is an immediate need to do that. If it's a policy that can wait for the next school year, then you don't amend it then. But if it needs to happen right now in order to stop the floodgates of some other type of behaviors that may happen, absolutely fine. And that's why you have that in there. And then the, the parent signature page. Um, this is the contractual agreement page. And even though your handbooks are electronic, I believe in that paper document that parents submit. And I always put that in a large three inch, three ring binder. And um, the length of time that I kept those parent signature pages varied by sometimes by the class. I always kept them for at least three to five years. Um, I just kept those binders and then after those years, you know, purged those papers and recycled that binder for the next group around. But if I had a parent that was particularly litigious or potentially litigious, I should say, then I would keep their signature page and the copy of that handbook. So you always want to archive your handbooks. So you've got like after 20, uh, 2021 school year, don't just throw that handbook away or delete it or put it in the trash bin in your computer. Keep archival copies of those. In the event that someone comes back with a lawsuit, here's what the policy was at the time that that student was enrolled in our school. Now I'm talking about the parent signature page, but I also, as you will see in my handbooks, have a place for the students to sign that says they have read or they've had the handbook read to them. And they enter into a covenant. They're not 18, they can't enter into a contract. 
that they enter into a covenant that says, I promise I'm going to adhere to these policies as a student at Holy Cross School during this particular school year. I mentioned earlier about this case where a handbook was used as a legal defense. So let's look at that case now. This is a case that took place in Ohio in 2016, and it was called DT versus St. Gabriel Consolidated Schools. And in this particular case, a private school student was suspended from school for one day as a punishment for intimidating another student. The suspended student's parents filed a breach of contract suit against the school, claiming that its suspension was counter to the provisions of the school handbook. An Ohio trial court held for the school and the appellate court, because it went through the Court of Appeals, affirmed that decision. The principal had not violated the handbook provisions by suspending the student. So here is where we can really see how important those policies that we have put in our handbook really are for our school community. And don't you think it was probably pretty affirming to that principle to look at that handbook and listen to the judge's decision and know that it was the provisions of the handbook the policies in the handbook that supported the decisions that were made by the administration as well. Now I'm including here some policies to consider for your handbooks that you may not yet have. And you're gonna see that some of those are rather timely in nature, but I wanted to kind of highlight those as well. The first policy has to do with tuition. And I communicated with a lot of schools last year when schools closed because of the pandemic about how they were gonna handle this tuition situation because parents were not wanting to pay tuition anymore. So I think a policy like this would be very helpful. If school is closed due to weather or a public concern, parents or guardians will still be responsible for payment of tuition. The education of each student will continue with virtual remote e-learning and you can personalize that to whatever you might have done or be doing, plan to do. Teachers will continue to plan standards-based lessons and evaluate student work. Report cards will be distributed at the end of each grading period. If a parent or a guardian cannot make the regular tuition payment, the principal should be notified as soon as possible to create a payment plan. And, and just as many people were laid off and their income um, was stopped during the pandemic, that's understandable. But you as a principal can't help them if you don't know about it. So that's why we include that pastoral kind of um, policy in there to say, let us know if something's happened that's making it difficult for you to be able to pay tuition. And I know we all heard stories about Catholic schools who were just hanging on prior to the pandemic, but who had to close as a result of the pandemic because of the fact that um, their financial situation changed so drastically that that was no longer viable for them to stay open. And here's a policy dealing with masks. If protective masks are recommended by the state or local officials, students will be expected to wear a mask while at school. Masks must not contain any offensive messages, fabrics, or be distracting to the learning environment. Now I am uh, an associate professor at a public university in Southern Indiana. And the president of our university has already stated that when we return in the fall, all students and all faculty members will be on campus wearing masks. And that's that. 
Now, at this particular time, uh, as I'm recording this video, our president of our school has, our university has not mandated that all uh, returning faculty and students have vaccines, but uh, that could change because we have seen Indiana University, which is uh, one of the largest universities in Indiana that's mandating that now. So um, it will be interesting to see if our university follows suit with that also. Here's a policy dealing with absences due to COVID-19. If a student tests positive for COVID-19 or is deemed by the local health department to be a close contact of an individual who has tested positive. The school will follow the most up-to-date CDC guidelines for student and faculty attendance. Students who are not COVID-19 positive and or symptomatic, but just a close contact will be expected to be in attendance for virtual instruction. In addition, students will be expected to complete all work and assessments. A student who is absent due to a positive COVID-19 test or named as a close contact will be marked absent and coded as C-19 to denote the reason for absence. And I do think it is important to have some way of noting those students who are absent because of COVID-19. And we saw in the last year, some students who you know, were out of school for 10 days because they were a close contact, contact and then they came back for one day and then they're out for another 10 days. And so I think it's really important to have a way of denoting how um, that, that student's particular absence as well. Now, if you've read my handbooks before, you know that I am a real advocate of sections that deal with parents as partners. But it came to me even more the, the importance of that during this pandemic. And so I kind of beefed up the parents as partners section of the handbook. In an e-learning environment or remote or whatever you call it at your school, the daily support of a parent or guardian is critical to providing students with continued quality education through e-learning. Specific guidelines will be provided to parents and guardians with detailed information regarding the e-learning schedule. In other words, and, and it's tough because I think parents had really a very challenging role in the last year and a half. And I also think that the respect for teachers went way up because they realized how hard it is to really teach, how hard it is to have the attention of one student or two students that they gave birth to versus 28 students that many of you have in your classrooms on a daily basis. And so I, I really wanted to accentuate the fact that that support from parents is really important for teachers, just as teachers have worked very hard to support the parents in, in their role. But we have to work together. We have to work together in this. Here's a policy dealing with emotional support animals. And we deal with this at the university level um, as a school principal in my last school, I dealt with a parent who wanted not only for her child to be able to bring an emotional support animal to school, but for her to bring the emotional support animal to school anytime she came into the office to drop something off or walk to school to pick up her child for end of the day dismissal. And their emotional support animal was a ferret, which also during that time uh, bit a secretary and a student. So uh, I, I can go on about that, but here's the policy. 
No emotional support animals will be permitted in school unless a student's IEP specifically states the need for such an extraordinary accommodation. And it is looked as, as extraordinary. Note it says the student's IEP, not the parents, although they may have needed one. But it's not just in, um, this is what they want, it has to be specifically stated. And that is really viewed as an extraordinary accommodation. And we deal with that in, in higher education also. And it becomes a real issue of whose rights supersede the rights of someone else, particularly when we have so many students who have allergies to pet dander. Um, that becomes a real issue as well. It's just a side note, uh, I'm a walker. And in March, when I was out walking, this little bitty dog, little dog, people would say it's not a big dog, little dog approached me while on the leash of his owner. The owner did not retract the leash. I heard my jeans rip first, and then I felt the sting of the little dog's sharp teeth in my leg, the front shin part of my leg. Um, just as a side, the owner never did say they were sorry, but I did have to have medical treatment, to have to be on antibiotics, get a tetanus shot. Um, and fortunately, you know, I'm a big person, but if it had been a little child or a child whose face or arm was closer to that little dog, look at the uh, situation. The dog was put in quarantine for 10 days, the uh, um, Board of uh, you know, Animal Control went out and quarantined the dog and checked the dog afterwards, which was a good thing. But it also made me very aware of the fact that not only could the pet dander be an issue, but I'll have to tell you quite honestly, that now when I'm out walking, I used to think, oh, a little dog cannot hurt me. I've changed my attitude about that. Um, so I look at all dogs with a little different skepticism. And uh, that's something I'm going to have to get over as well, I guess. So I might need an emotional support animal to help me to do that. I've also included in the handbook some online instruction uh, and behavior guidelines. So some of these may pertain to you in your school, some may not, you can pick and choose, but I think it might be helpful to have something like this because we don't know what the future is gonna bring for us. In the event that instruction should be online, students should be respectful of the teacher and other students. Students should use their correct names. They should be seated in a chair or at a desk, not in a bed. They should not use cell phones during instruction. They should be dressed appropriately, not wearing pajamas. They should understand that the session will be recorded. They should never share login information. They should not be eating or drinking during instruction. Now, one caveat to that might be, you know, to have water available for them, uh, for students to be able to have a drink of water during the class. So, you know, that's absolutely fine. But uh, the issue becomes when they're eating um, nachos or chips and, you know, the distraction to the learning. And then it becomes the haves and have nots too. Pets should not be in the learning session. And due to confidentiality guidelines, only the student enrolled in the class should be present in the session. And that became a great issue during our online learning environments the whole way across the United States, not just in one area. Students involved in inappropriate online behavior may be separated from the session and not allowed to return until a conference has been held with the student and the parent or guardian. So these are some broad kind of guidelines that I hope will be helpful to you um, because we may even have students in the fall 
I'm not sure where the vaccination um, situation issue guidelines are going to be, but students who are going to have to be involved in online instruction. So I think it's good to have these policies, maybe that you don't need, but that you have in place anyway. Now, I listed for you some policies that are new that are in place in handbooks for this next year. However, there is a rather lengthy list of components of a parent student handbook that I am more than glad to share with you. Um, and it's, it's a long list, um, but I can send it to you as a Word document. And one of the things that I find helpful with these components of parent, student, or faculty handbook is I find it helpful to have that list of components there next to my handbook or next to a handbook that I'm reviewing to go through and look and see, does this handbook have these components listed? Now, keep in mind that maybe in your school, some of those components may not be pertinent and that is absolutely fine but you need to look and see, do we have something like that? Would it be helpful if we did include that in our handbook in the future? So those components will also be available to you as well. And I have listed here also my email address. And um, some of you who have, um, heard me speak in the last um, 20 some years, know that my email address has changed somewhat. It used to just be wanamuel at aol.com, but um, now it's S. Wanamuel, hopefully that's easier for people to see at aol.com. And so it's just my first initial and my last name. And so I encourage you to make note of that. And then every year by the end of March, if you want to send me an email and ask if I would share with you my most recent and up-to-date handbooks, I am more than glad to do that. Also, after this session, if you want to send me an email and ask me to send you the six handbooks that I spoke about already, I am more than glad to do that as well. I'll also attach the components of the parent, student, and the faculty handbook if you request those and you find that that would be helpful for you also. I hope that you found that this time together has been helpful and beneficial to you. Um, one of the things you're gonna see when you go through and look at the handbook is that some of the policies that you heard me discuss dealing with parents and with students and with COVID are also reflected in the faculty handbook as well. This has been a very difficult and different time for all people, um, but for teachers and for principals in particular. You know, I work at a university preparing future teachers, future principals, and future superintendents. And I looked at our curriculum as we've been going through this pandemic and thought, really there's very little that we're teaching in any of those programs that really help to prepare people for what they faced in the last year. But one of the things that we, I think have done well as educators and continue to do well, particularly as Catholic educators, is to be very flexible, and to know that we can do all things with God who gives us strength. And so I look forward to seeing all of you next year in Louisville and during this next year, which we hopefully will return to a greater sense of normalcy. I will pray in the words of St. Paul for each of you, the God who began this good work in you will carry it through to completion. And one day when we see one another in heaven, we will look at each other and we will say, well done. We have been good and faithful servants. So 
God bless your summer. Enjoy your summer and uh, many blessings to you as you begin the 2021-2022 school year.